Welcome everyone. This video represents just part of a bid to try to secure the release of two young Burmese men from the Bangkwang Central Prison, also known as the notorious Bangkok Hilton. Although I am a lawyer, I have never received nor sought any financial reward at all for my efforts to help Zor Lin and Wai Pyo. It is simply abundantly clear to me that they were framed for the murders of Hannah Withridge and David Miller. So in light of the travesty of justice, I have willingly spent my own money and a huge amount of my time trying to secure their release. They were convicted in December of 2015 and sentenced to death. They lost their final appeal in the Supreme Court of Thailand in August of 2019. However, in August of 2020, the King of Thailand, King Rama X, as part of a general amnesty, commuted all death sentences in Thailand to terms of life in prison. At this point in time, the only person with the power to release Zorlin and Wai Pyo, to grant them pardons, is the King of Thailand, King Rama X. Now many of you would know that back in 2016, many Burmese nationals put together a petition for his father, King Rama IX, and they secured 97,037 signatures. That was a great effort, but unfortunately at that time, King Rama IX was gravely ill. After the Burmese men lost their final appeal in the Supreme Court of Thailand, their Thai lawyers made a plea to King Rama X for pardons, but unfortunately they did not receive a response. Now it may well be that a regent or other advisor did not pass any communication on to King Rama X, but given that the Thai lawyers failed, there would be no chance whatsoever that a plea from a mere Australian lawyer would even be considered. Even though His Majesty enjoyed his education in Sydney and graduated from the Royal Military College at Duntroon with the rank of Captain in the Royal Thai Army. In the circumstances, it seems that for any plea to have a chance of being favourably considered, it really needs to be delivered via a government such as the government of Germany or via a member of a royal family and there are over a dozen royal families in the world. To follow is a nine page letter I sent to the Minister for Foreign Affairs for Germany which was received on the 26th of July 2022. I also sent copies of the letter to the foreign ministers and secretaries of state of a dozen other countries and also to the ambassadors to Australia of those dozen other countries. My letter dated the 8th of July 2022 to the Honourable Annalena Baerbock, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Federal Foreign Office in Berlin in the Federal Republic of Germany reads as follows. Dear Minister, regarding Thailand's King Rama X, plea for pardons for two Burmese scapegoats, Zor Lin and Wai Pyo, also known as Win Zor Tun, Kotao murders, 15th of September 2014. I'm writing to ask a very great favour for the above named two Burmese men who have been incarcerated in Thai prisons for the past eight years, convicted of the murders of two British backpackers on the Thai island of Koh Tao. These were murders that they almost certainly did not commit. For the sake of clarity, I advise that I am merely a semi-retired Australian lawyer and therefore I did not represent either of the men at their 21-day trial in the Sumui Provincial Court, Thailand from the 8th of July 2015 to the 11th of October 2015. The judgment was delivered on the 24th of December 2015, whereupon they were both found guilty and sentenced to death. Zor Lin and Wai Pyo lost their final appeal to the Supreme Court of Thailand on the 29th of August 2019, and I am reliably informed 
that an appeal for pardons from their Thai lawyers to His Majesty King Rama X unfortunately did not receive a response. As you are probably aware, Thailand had a nine-year de facto moratorium on carrying out the death penalty until the 18th of June 2018, when a prisoner was executed, which was after His Majesty ascended the throne and performed with his consent. The execution drew widespread criticism from the international community. Interestingly, in August of 2020, King Rama X commuted all death sentences to life sentences. It is open to conclude that His Majesty did so in response to the condemnation of the 2018 execution. I feel that I am probably stating many facts that you already know. Indeed, I would not be surprised if the German government influenced His Majesty to cease all executions. The specific favour I humbly request is that the German government makes a very polite request of His Majesty or any relevant regent to pardon the young men and send them back to their grieving families in Myanmar, also known as Burma. The young men had simply been exploited, working on the island as cheap labour in order to support their needy parents in Myanmar. As you would be aware, His Majesty and his extensive entourage happened to be guests of Bavaria for most of the year, and therefore the German government is likely to be far more persuasive and influential than any other person, organisation or government. Please forgive my impertinence for making this request for assistance, which, in the short term, could merely free the lives of just two small 29-year-old men who came from impoverished and isolated villages on the Burmese island of Ramri. I do assure you that I am acutely aware of the absolutely massive humanitarian calamities in both Germany and more widely in Europe arising from the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the refugee crisis from North Africa. In my defence of the request, I advise that millions of Myanmar nationals were devastated by the convictions and hundreds of thousands participated in protests throughout Myanmar and on the border with Thailand. In addition, it was widely accepted, although not universally accepted, by Thai nationals that the convicted men were used as scapegoats to protect members of the influential Tavichian family that owns many of the bars and resorts on Koh Tao. Moreover, the judgment and the original sentence of the death penalty were met with horror from human rights groups and millions of people around the world given the exceptionally dubious evidence. It is worth noting that a Change.org petition started by a US citizen, Christopher Harkins, eight years ago in support of the accused men quickly received over 113,000 signatures worldwide and a petition to the UK government started by Pat Harrington, the mother of one of dozens of tourists who was apparently murdered in 2012, received 18,000 signatures. To further highlight the international support for the convicted men, According to the human rights activist Andy Hall and the Thai defence lawyer uh, Netasiri Bergman, the international community donated in the vicinity of $100,000 US dollars to pay the travel costs and accommodation costs of six Thai lawyers who were obliged to fly back and forth between Bangkok and Koh Samui on multiple occasions over a 21-day trial. The Thai Ministry of Justice did not cover that burden that was imposed by the Samui Provincial Court. Within Thailand, a Thai language Facebook page called CSILA, administered by a former Thai national living in Los Angeles, exploded in popularity from 300,000 followers to 1 million followers as the administrator and other contributors exposed a string of lies and bogus claims from the Royal Thai Police and the Tuvuchian family. I have made a list of 24 outsiders who have died on the tiny island of Koh Tao since January 2000. I do not pretend that the list is completely comprehensive. The list includes a German national from Ingolstadt, Mr. Bernd Grotsch, 47, who was found dead in his jungle home on the island on the 17th of June 2018. His German family were unable to obtain any proper autopsy report. 
Four of the people on the list died in avoidable accidents, but the others can all be classified as murders or as suspicious deaths. In the circumstances, I intend forwarding a copy of this letter to the foreign ministers of all the countries that have one or more citizens who died on Kotau, with the same request that I am making of the German government. The contents of this letter are also relevant to the ordinary citizens of the world, especially those whose fellow countrymen have died or been assaulted on Kotau. The list in chronological order, including their names, ages, nationalities and dates of death. Their pictures appear in the tapestry of images on the right of screen, starting on the first line and moving from left to right. We have Ian Jacobs, 35, from Great Britain, Virat Azavachin, 42, who was a Thai national from Bangkok and of Chinese descent. There was Hiroshi in his 30s from Japan, Yoshi Sazawa, 39, from Japan, Ben Harrington, 28, from Great Britain, Anthony Cardullo, 44, from California in the USA. Next line, Nick Pearson, 25, from Great Britain. Hannah Witheridge, 23, from Great Britain. David Miller, 24, from the island of Jersey in the English Channel. An unnamed Belgian male, age 26. Hans-Peter Suter, 44, from Switzerland. Silje Matheson, 22, from Norway. Third line, Dimitri Povsi, 29, from France. Christina Annesley, 23, from Great Britain and born in New Zealand with dual citizenship. Luke Miller, 26, from Great Britain. Valentina Novosanova, 23, from Russia. Shelley Bott, 50, from Canada. Elise Dallemagna, 30, from Belgium. Bernd Grotsch, 47, from Germany. Alexander Buxpan, 33, from Moldova. Rocio Gomez, 39, from Argentina. Samyak Chowdhury, 22, from India. Anshu Sacha Tamaku, 55, from Thailand and mixed Indian. Rakeshwa Sacha Tamaku, 59, from Thailand and of Indian descent. Brief details of the murders of the 15th of September 2014 and trial. At about 6am on the 15th of September 2014, a mute Burmese beach cleaner discovered the battered bodies of Hannah Witheridge and David Miller at the southern end of Sairi Beach, Koh Tao. The police were called, but they did not secure the crime scene. The police took gruesome pictures of the bodies and posted them on social media platforms. Many of those pictures are still visible on the internet. Many tourists also took pictures of the near naked bodies, including the genital areas and of Hannah's face, which had been largely severed from her head. It was widely rumored that the wealthy and powerful Tuvician family were behind the murders and that David and Hannah got into an argument with some members of the family in the AC bar on the evening of the 14th and 15th of September 2014. It is also widely understood that 22-year-old Warat Tuwichian fled the island at about 5.30 a.m. on a boat called Little Duck and made his way to Bangkok. In late September 2014, Royal Thai Police Lieutenant General Panya Marman publicly stated that he had enough CCTV evidence to implicate both Montreuil Tuichian and Warat Tuichian in the murders and added that there would be no scapegoats. However, Panya was then immediately taken off the case and the police general Somyot Pumpan Muang took an active interest in all aspects of the case. Somyot became chief of police from the 1st of October 2014 until the 30th of September 2015. In that time, he went to great lengths to deflect attention away from the Tavuchian family while framing the young Burmese men. It later emerged that during the same period, 
Somyot received a total of 300 million baht from Victoria's Secret, which was the largest illegal brothel in Bangkok. The brothel was widely reported to have been involved in human sex trafficking and to have been using underage girls. Of great relevance to the murder case is that the brothel was also a huge conduit for money laundering and reverse money laundering. It is therefore open to strongly suspect that some or all of the 300 million baht originally came from the wealthy Tovician family as payment to Somyot for protecting Montrawat and Warat and framing the Burmese men. The case against Zorlin and Waipyo was eventually shown to be non-existent. However, the police headed by Somyot boasted that the men had confessed to the crimes of murder and rape. They also boasted that DNA from semen allegedly recovered from the body of the female victim matched the DNA of Zorlin and Waipyo. It is widely known that the Royal Thai Police routinely use torture to extract false confessions from accused persons. One of the most popular torture techniques that does not leave marks or bruises involves suffocating a victim with a plastic bag. This was one of the torture techniques that the accused Burmese men said was inflicted upon them. Indeed, in August 2021, a police colonel nicknamed Joe Ferrari and his men managed to murder a suspected drug dealer on camera using a plastic bag and the video went viral. Interestingly, those police were merely trying to extort money from their victim and not solve any crimes. Once the Burmese men received legal representation, they retracted their confessions. The police were then left with just the DNA evidence, which would have been powerful had it actually existed. For months, the defence lawyers requested some of the original mixed semen sample for retesting, which the police claimed and boasted that they had. However, at the commencement of the trial in July 2015, the police conceded that they did not have any of the original material explaining that it had been used up or lost. The police went on to tell the court that they had amplified DNA, which is akin to a copy from an unknown source. At this point, and with the greatest respect to the Thai judges, any competent judge should have rejected the alleged DNA evidence as inadmissible if no sample was available to the defence for retesting. The case should have been thrown out, but with respect, Thai courts do not have any consistent concept of what constitutes admissible evidence or inadmissible evidence. There was no case to answer, but the trial dragged on for 21 days, ending in shocking convictions and two death sentences. The Royal Thai Police were essentially saying, trust us, we had a match, we cannot actually prove anything, but you should just take our word for it. It would be outrageous for a prosecutor and police to assert that an accused person's fingerprints were found at a burglary, but then failed to produce that evidence in court. Likewise, it would be outrageous for police to allege that a person was caught with one kilogram of cocaine, but then not have any of the remaining cocaine after they tested a small sample. YPO did admit coming into possession of David Miller's mobile phone, which he said he found on the beach and then gave to a friend named Ren Ren. There was absolutely nothing to tie Zor Lin to the mobile phone. Having possession of the mobile phone would be cause for suspicion, but far too little to convict Waipio of murder. In many jurisdictions, one can be convicted of stealing from persons unknown if an item that is found is then used in a manner inconsistent with the rights of the true owner. Therefore, there was enough to convict YPO of stealing from a person unknown, but far too little to convict YPO of murder or rape. I advise that I have created over 100 videos of Kotal murders and the 2014 murder case, which are available on the YouTube channel Kotal Murders Death Island, should you or your staff wish to explore some of the issues in greater depth. I wish to avoid including too much detail in this letter. However, 
it is worth noting that the Melbourne forensic scientist Jane Torpen flew to Samui to assist the defence lawyers. An advisor to the lawyers, Englishman Andy Hall, previously asked me to put him in touch with Jane, which I did. Jane did cite the unendorsed report that the police submitted as their DNA evidence. When she returned to Australia, Jane told me that she regarded the document as meaningless. In January 2016, I put the Fairfax journalist Lindsay Murdoch in touch with Jane, whereupon he penned a useful article for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age of Melbourne, with Jane's insights of the unendorsed report. The article is available on the internet. The unendorsed report contained multiple breaches of the international standard ISO 17025, and later, in 2016, I finally learned that the relevant police laboratory did not even have the appropriate accreditation to perform the testing at that time. However, one cannot stress strongly enough that once the police conceded that they had no original mixed semen sample for retesting, their case against the accused collapsed. After all, it takes only five microliters to test a mixed sample, so one teaspoon is enough for 1,000 tests. If they ever retrieved a mixed semen sample, it could not all be used up as claimed by the police. On the 10th of February 2016, in a preamble to an article of mine which he published, the British freelance journalist Andrew Drummond, who spent many years in Thailand, penned the following comment. I have attended enough trials in Thailand to never be surprised by a verdict and never surprised when the verdict flies in the face of what I have heard in court. It is also worth noting that the Burmese men had never been in trouble with the police and that they are quite tiny, only about five feet tall, whereas David Miller was about six foot three inches in height. Thailand does not have criminal law as we know it. I acknowledge that nations refrain from interfering in the laws and judicial processes of other nations. However, as someone who has attended several Thai courts and who studied jurisprudence, the philosophy of law, I am in a reasonably sound position to put forward the proposition that Thailand does not actually have criminal law as those in the West understand the concept. Law can be briefly defined as a set of rules that a legitimate authority will enforce. Law is not merely books or statutes or buildings or people dressed in robes. Several years ago, the American academic David Streckfuss stressed in a talk to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand that Thailand's criminal courts overall have a staggering 99.2% conviction rate. This constitutes some anecdotal evidence that it is the police and not the courts who decide whether a person is guilty of a crime. In addition, a judge in the Yala Provincial Court, Kanakorn Pianchana, attempted suicide in court complaining that more senior judges who had not heard any evidence ordered him to hand down guilty verdicts against certain persons accused on terrorism offences. I submit that the police are not a legitimate authority for the purpose of the definition. I further submit that senior judges who are not trial judges or appeal judges cannot be a legitimate authority either. It is common knowledge within Thailand that courts do not follow precedents even from higher courts. Therefore, the interpretation of provisions in the Thai Criminal Code vary greatly from one court to another. The interpretation is utterly random. I certainly found that this was the case with the Draconian Computer Crimes Act. In July of 2015, I sat through a three-day trial in the Phuket Provincial Court. The Royal Thai Navy had brought criminal defamation charges against the Australian journalist Alan Morrison and his partner Chutima Siddhasatian for republishing a Reuters article in which a person was quoted as saying that 
Thai naval forces were involved in the trafficking of Rohingya boat people. The Navy did not try to sue the influential Reuters news service, yet picked on the tiny journalists, but that is another issue. Central to the prosecution case was the interpretation of the term Thai naval forces, which the Navy asserted had to mean the Royal Thai Navy and nothing else. Allen and Chutima did not even write the article, but they pointed out that the term could include Thai Marine Police or Thai Customs Vessels. The witness for the Royal Thai Navy was a Navy Captain, which is the equivalent rank of an Army Colonel. He gave his expert evidence in the witness box, but conceded that he spoke absolutely no English. However, he explained to the judges that another Navy officer who supposedly was expert in English told him that the term meant Royal Thai Navy and nothing else. There were several problems with the captain's evidence. Firstly, it was entirely hearsay and should have been rejected as such. The so-called expert was not available for cross-examination. Secondly, the captain was in no position to assess whether his colleague was indeed expert in English or had only an intermediate or beginner's command of the language. The judge did not reject the captain's evidence. The evidence should have been rejected with a ruling that the accused had no case to answer, but the trial dragged on for two more days. The judges in the Koh Tao murder trial decided to reject some defence evidence on gait analysis of a person running near the crime scene as hearsay, yet accepted important aspects of the DNA evidence that was hearsay. Like a Greek tragedy, Laura Witheridge, the sister of Hannah Witheridge, did not believe that Wai Pyo or Zorlin murdered or harmed her sister. However, tragically, members of the family of David Miller were convinced that Wai Pyo and Zorlin were guilty and made very public comments to that effect. However, the Miller family also made up their minds in the first few months following the murders, evidenced by a public statement to the effect that they thought the police evidence against the accused was very strong. This was before July 2015, when the Royal Thai Police were caught out without any original mixed semen for retesting. The American writer Mark Twain wrote, It's easier to fool people than it is to convince them that they have been fooled. The British Foreign and Commonwealth Office, FCO, always had a conflict of interest. The staff do wish to protect and assist British citizens, but there is a greater interest in maintaining happy international relations. In the circumstances, the FCO staff would not reveal to the families of the victims everything they know about Koh Tao or the murders. The Miller family could therefore be misled by omission if they assumed that the FCO put their family's interests first. On the 21st of August 2015, there was a hearing before Mr Justice Green in the High Court of Justice in London on an application by the accused men to access a British police report on the Koh Tao murders held by the Commissioner of Police for the Metropolis. The defendant opposed the application. Assistant Commissioner Cressida Dick stated, I believe it would significantly undermine the Thai authorities' relationship with UK law enforcement, if not the wider relationship between the two governments, given the high-profile nature of the case. Judgment was made on the 25th of August 2015. The Burmese men's application did not succeed. In a sense, the lack of disclosure practiced by the Royal Thai Police was imparted upon the British Police. In closing, Minister, I advise that to the best of my ability, I will be pleased to provide any further details that you or your staff require. I've tried to steer a course between the twin evils of providing too much and too little information in this preliminary letter. I do hope that for the sake of Zorlin, Waipio, their families and millions of their supporters around the globe, 
that your government is able to assist in securing the young men's freedom. I would also be most obliged if you or your staff would be kind enough to send a reply to this letter. Yours very sincerely and respectfully, Ian Yarwood. It's true that countries normally refrain from interfering in the internal affairs and judicial processes of other countries, but there are exceptions. Unfortunately, in Thai courts, judges do not always pay attention to the evidence. A British senior coroner described a death inquiry on the neighbouring island of Koh Phangan as almost medieval, and with the utmost respect, a similar assessment could be made of Thai courts. Ladies and gentlemen, I have only one tiny little voice, but many of you who live in democratic countries have the power to write to your own politicians, to your own representatives, and if you have a royal family, you've got the power to write to your own royal family and request that they make representations to the King of Thailand, King Rama X, to spare the two young men, Zorlin and Wai Pyo. I should stress, ladies and gentlemen, that the dangers that are present on Koh Tao and other parts of the Gulf of Thailand are by no means typical of the situation in the vast majority of the beautiful country known as Thailand. Most Thai people are absolutely wonderful. However, the Thai police have a very well-earned reputation of being incredibly corrupt and as I pointed out there are very real dangers on the Thai island of Koh Tao. I would really appreciate it if you could share this video on your own social media platforms. If you could take just one second to give the video a like or take a couple of minutes to leave your constructive comments in the section below. I've also got a reference here to an excellent book for those of you who wish to do some further reading about the crimes and murders on Koh Tao. Thank you so much for watching until the very end. Stay safe and look after each other. Bye for now.